Jane, as we said to Marty, I should say, right, is um, is that, um, you know, I'm just going to frame it very briefly. And then, um, uh, yes, your 12-year-old can join. It's totally fine if your 12-year-old joins. Um, it's, I, think, I think it's a good thing uh, because, uh, you know, you are here uh, with um, two of the really key players. I could call them the core players, but I'd be doing a little bit of a pun uh, <laughs> on Ben's business um, uh, to combating and standing up against anti-Semitism and the hate we face in our world today and every day in our country. Um, you have ADL's incoming national chair, Ben Sachs, um, and the New York, New Jersey regional director of ADL, Scott Richmond. Um, they're people I know, both of them, uh, well, one of them really well. And um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Ben must have joined about a year or two after I started here as an assistant rabbi. Uh, I, I started in 87, right? I think Ben probably joined in 89 or 90. 89. Yep. And uh, I watched his kids from being little nothings, boy chicks, to growing up into wonderful human beings. Uh, Bar mitzvahs, my contramans. Uh, though Scott did not belong here, I worked a long time with him when he was uh, regional director of AJC and also on his um, still, I think, wonderful radio program. Uh, is it still at VOX, Scott? It is. It was actually revived. Um, I took a, a hiatus for a bit. And uh, as of May, I have a new radio show, new podcast. Awesome. Everybody should listen from the front lines. From the front lines. These are two of really uh, the frontline folks. Uh, I'm gonna ask them questions as we go. If you have questions along the way, throw them into the chat. I'll open up my chat right now. Um, so I'll see them, Marty will see them, and then we'll figure out how to, how to integrate them in. Um, so the first question obviously is just uh, in asking you how you got to ADL, that's really a question about you know, your background and, and what you're doing here today. So I'll go first with that. I, I guess um, 25 years ago, came to Larchmont um, and uh, was looking for something to do philanthropically. At the time, it didn't have to be Jewish, but it would be okay if it was Jewish related. Um, my older son, Matthew, came home one day from the playground with a very concerned story to tell us, which is that there were some swastika paintings on the walls in the Murray Avenue School playground. And we found out later on several Jewish um, families' homes in Larchmont and Mamaroneck. And a friend of mine, um, Glenn Louie, who was involved with the ADL at the time, contacted the ADL and they launched an offensive, essentially, sending people up to the community, talking to parents about how they should talk about hate with their children, talking to teachers about they, how they should talk to their pupils and the parents and um, administrators. And they, it all came together with a, an event where clergy and civic leaders and parents and families came together. And uh, it was unbelievably well organized. And it was essentially not only about fighting anti-Semitism, anti but also telling people that fighting all kinds of hate feeds directly into these issues. And I was wowed by it. I raised my hand. I got very involved with the New York regional office at that time. Uh, I'll jump in. First of all, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, you know, I don't know how I'll do on an empty stomach. I haven't had this, uh, uh, this challenge before. I speak a lot, but usually not, uh, not on your before. So thank you for that. It's great to be um, uh, be working with Rabbi Serkman again and, and Larchman Temple. Uh, a lot of good memories, especially uh, honoring you, Rabbi Serkman, at the diversity breakfast for your amazing interfaith efforts. Um, my story is that I started off life as an investment banker and a lawyer. I practiced for a couple of years, but uh, somebody knew something about my background. I had been very active with the uh, Soviet Jewry movement at Penn, where I went undergrad. And uh, this was the mid 90s. And, and the Soviet Union was now open up and, and uh, many, many Jews were, um, were sort of uh, accessible again. 
And the JDC came to me and asked me to be the representative for their programs in the former Soviet Union. And it changed my life. I went from being a lawyer to being a Jewish communal professional. And I spent 10 years traveling back and forth between New York and the former Soviet Union every other month, really helping to rebuild Jewish life and create an infrastructure for elderly. I, uh, I moved on to a series of positions and I uh, was very fortunate that uh, Fred Block, who I know is, uh, is on the Zoom call, came to me uh, maybe a year and a half ago. And he said, you know, uh, positions opened up at ADL, would you be interested? And uh, I immediately said, yes. Uh, so I owe a lot to Fred to, uh, you know, having brought me into this organization, a really uh, amazing organization doing incredible work and, and really very timely work at this moment. So since you, uh, you really Scott framed it in that way, so ADL is really the central address for combating hate. And of course its, orig its origins, anti-Semitism specifically. Looking at the world today, especially at our country and this moment um, with so many things going on, how do you, how do you frame or understand um, you know, what we're facing it, as, as far as anti-Semitism goes? How would you describe what's going on today and how do you understand it? So you know, maybe uh, Ben will start and then I'll, I'll kind of jump in. Please. So, you know, a lot of times I think what happens is in areas of this country where there's a fairly sizable Jewish populations, you don't feel anti-Semitism like you might in other parts of the country. But the fact is that the situation with anti-Semitism is not so great right now. And I guess the way I might answer it is uh, we have at the ADL something called the Center on Extreme Extremism, and uh, they've been tracking anti-Semitic incidents since 1979. And uh, the most recent um, poll that they took essentially was in 2020, uh, which was down slightly from the year before. 2019 was the highest year of recorded incidences, but they recorded a couple of thousand incidences across the country, including harassment, assaults, incidences, you know, not only in the K through 12 schools, but also colleges and universities. There were 327 reported incidences um, occurred at Jewish institutions, 331 incidences attributed to known extremist groups. And as you might not be surprised during a global pandemic, something called Zoom bombing became a thing. Um, and this is where known extremists that have been tracked by the ADL for years found their way and hacked into Zoom conferences where they took over and spewed anti-Semitic information and broadcast signs and symbols. And um, quite frankly, you know, it's, it's amazing the kinds of reach um, that these people have. But one of the things we'll talk about in a little bit probably is that one of the interesting things that we found is that a lot of anti-Semitic reporting occurs in and around the 25 regional offices that we have across the country. Um, but ADL is beginning to partner with a bunch of other organizations so that I'm guessing that the reporting will probably grow from there. And I, I'll just add, you know, uh, this, this trajectory is not necessarily like a, a straight line. I mean, I'm, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. When I was growing up, I really thought very little about anti-Semitism. It was just not part of the conversation. It was not something that I mean, it's obviously still there, but not something that I worried about so much. It was not like my parents' generation. Uh, you know, my parents' generation, there were quotas for Jews in universities, Jews not being allowed into country clubs, um, Jews not being allowed in, in the, the corporate suites. Uh, that has now changed, you know, starting around the 2010s, we saw an incredible uptick in this audit that Ben mentioned. Um, you know, the, this audit is not a, a survey. It's not um, ADL reaching out and saying, have you been the victim of an anti-Semitic incident? Or uh, uh, are you concerned about anti-Semitism? We do that too. It's the reflection of our work every day. So I have staff that respond to incidents in New York and on average, my staff is responding to 30 incidents a week. These are not incidents that are reported necessarily in the news uh, or you know, in the radio, whatever, you're, you're not hearing about them, but they literally happen every day. And of course there's underreporting. That's just what happens to be reported to ADL. 
But you know, you're comparing apples and apples year to year, and you can have a sense of where we are. And I think it was fairly shocking last year that we were at historically high levels in the audit that Ben mentioned, despite physical distancing and lockdowns and things like this. Uh, a lot of what we saw was anti-Semitism online. And if I could talk for a second very specifically about New York, uh, you know, I'm the director for ADL's work in New York and New Jersey. We have 25 offices around the country. All of those offices are doing this work uh, on a daily basis, responding to anti-Semitic incidents. But we, uh, in this audit, tracked anti-Semitic incidents in 47 states. It's a reflection of that. And New York is number one across the entire country in terms of anti-Semitic incidents by far. And New Jersey, by the way, is number two, uh, also by far. Uh, the top five far outweigh uh, the, other, uh, the other 42 states. Uh, so we're talking about uh, over 300 anti-Semitic incidents that took place in 2020, uh, documented. Uh, we, um, uh, although we're responding to many, many more, we're very, very careful about what we consider to be anti-Semitism. Um, some people think that things are anti-Semitic just because it targets a Jewish person, but not necessarily. Uh, we, we have a, a reputation and credibility, so we're really careful about what we say is actually anti-Semitism. Well, we, you, know, you could say, well, that's where the Jews are. Of course, that's where there's gonna be a majority of incidents, however, one doesn't necessarily play, you know, play into the other. Um, just because there's a predominance of Jews in place X, um, you know, there's a lot of Jews in Chicago. There's a lot of Jews in LA. There's a lot of Jews in Boston. Um, so, why is all of this? I mean, I mean, I saw the data from the set, the you know, the center and the the ADL charts, um, 2018, 19. So why now? Why this? Why now? We have our understanding, perhaps politically, but how do you see it in the bigger picture? So, you know, this isn't going to surprise anybody, but, you know, I would say it's due to greater polarization in our society and it's magnified by social media and cable news. Um, one of the things that Jonathan Greenblatt did, he's, he's the current ADL CEO and national director who came to the organization about five years ago. He likes to say, I guess Abe Foxman said this too, it's not about the right or the left, it's about being right or wrong. Um, ADL gets criticized by both sides. If we, if we get criticized by both sides, we feel like we're actually in the right place because we try to be a centrist organization. Um, but there's an interesting complication these days, which is that in the old days, it felt like the extreme right and the extreme left was about 5%. Given what's gone on in our politics, um, it feels like it's grown as if there's somehow 20% of extremists on each side. And so that, that is sort of also just exacerbated by misinformation on social media and cable news, um, I think, you know, has made the polarization even worse. Um, last year, just as an example of something that ADL did really quite successfully, um, after having worked with Facebook for a couple of years behind the scenes and trying to get them to take basically lies off of their site. So for example, people who are Holocaust deniers or politicians saying things that were simply not true, um, the ADL actually put a consortium of uh, nonprofits together and championed something called Stop Hate for Profit. And what that was, was we convinced about 150 companies to stop advertising on Facebook for a full month. And one thing led to another, it was extraordinarily successful. And what did Facebook do? They actually were forced to be a little bit more specific about changing its position. And they started doing a better job of sanitizing their, their platform and taking false information off. And of, of course, as everybody probably remembers, um, Twitter, who was watching this happen, um, stopped uh, Donald Trump's feed. It, you know, and I'll, I'll just add in terms of, uh, of social media, uh, you know, what, what I think was really the straw for, for ADL was when Mark Zuckerberg said he would allow Holocaust denial on his site. Uh, this was in 2018. He said as much as he abhors it, uh, this is not something that he would stop. 
So that, that was you know, particularly heinous. And ADL had been uh, calling for hate to be removed from social media for years, but we stepped up our efforts and the Stop Hate for Profit Coalition that Ben mentioned was really the culmination of that. You know, we saw a moment in time with the racial justice movement. It was a time when the, when the country was listening in a much better way. And when we could partner, you know, ADL fighting or the Jewish community fighting hate alone is not enough. And we, we reach out to coalition partners. We're a, a bit of a unique organization fighting hate. That, that is our mission. And, and other, uh, other ethnic and faith groups don't necessarily have uh, an entity strictly devoted to fighting hate. But the Jewish community does. But we need to do that with, uh, with others. And, I, you know, I just want to add one word about polarization. Um, you know, the, the concept of polarization, I think, is, is really important when we, when we think about what's happening in our society. You know, the ways to fight hate and the way to fight anti-Semitism, uh, I, I often talk about three ways. One is through legislation, uh, and that's great. And those are, you know, the guardrails. Uh, second is education. Um, which changes hearts and minds. And that's really the way that you, you fight hate. But the way that we can do this at the grassroots level is really by civil society, by people, individual people saying, I have a, a, a it's important to me to not engage in hate against you and you shouldn't engage in hate against me. And if we see hate, we push it to the margins of society. We say that it's simply unacceptable. And the problem with polarization is that in a time of polarization, the, the margins of society become, they, they start moving towards the center and people on one side will excuse what goes on on their side and they will say about people on the other side, no matter what they say, it's wrong. And it's very difficult to push hate to the margins of society when you're in a situation of polarization where people are excusing what happens on their, society, uh, on their side. You have to be capable of saying that, you know, I may be a part of the left, but what the left is doing is wrong. So we both of you alluded to it, but, you know, we live in a post January 6th world where we saw just uh, and again, you know, some of our some of the explanation for these past this uptick, you know, coincides with the the uh, the term of the previous president. So, so we know that there's a factor, but it, you can't just pin it on that. It's dangerous, actually, to pin it on that alone. Um, what we've seen, however, is, as you just said, Scott, I think wisely, that um, ex when the margins start bleeding in to mainstream, we, we, what we see is we see January 6th. We also see, uh, you know, so I know that in the center on extremism, uh, you track um, white supremacist movements. Um, and I know that we don't know, we don't know the half of it. We don't know the third of it. We don't know the 10th of it. Um, because we, we, I think we'd be really challenged to understand it. How do how do you deal with that as ADL and how do you help us understand it? So actually Oren Siegel, who heads up the center on extremism came for a brotherhood breakfast to Larchmont temple. It was very well attended. And, um, this center monitors extremism across the entire ideological spectrum. They have investigators, researchers, technical experts, and they all strategically monitor, expose, and disrupt extremist threats. That's on the ground and on the internet. We actually send people to skinhead conventions. We have a team of people combing the internet 24 seven looking for things that are troublesome. One of the things that I think maybe a lot of people don't know is that the information that we garnered, we then share with the FBI and local law enforcement when we think it's important for them to know that this stuff is going on. The FBI and local law enforcement are a little bit restricted in terms of the reach that they have into certain places, but the ADL is not actually restricted. And one of the things you mentioned January 6th, Rabbi Serkman, um, you know, we were monitoring over 200 known extremists that were actively taking part in the insurrection. Um, 
and share actively and on a real time basis, sharing information with the FBI and local law enforcement. A lot of this information has been used and has been crucial in terms of bringing uh, cases against these people after January 6th. And I'll say just one more thing, and I'm sure Scott has more to add, but we also have produced something called a heat map, which if you go to the ADL website, you can take a look at it. And it's really the first of its kind. Heat is, it stands for hate, extremism, anti-Semitism, and terrorism. And it's an interactive map that details hate and extremist incidents and anti-Semitic incidents, both by state and nationwide. And it's updated monthly. And I'm thinking that it probably is actually going to be um, upgraded to reflect things even more quickly as we raise more money for the center. I mean, the only thing I'll add is that uh, ADL Center on Extremism has not been around just since January 6th. Uh, it's many, many decades old. It really got its start in the 1930s with uh, tracking Nazis in this country. It moved into the, you know, the 1950s with uh, trying to stop the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, you know, it, it has a, a really long and storied history and uh, it's an organization, an entity uh, within ADL. Um, that is uh, you know, a bit unique and uh, has really done extraordinary work. And, and of course, in a moment like January 6th, which they, they were predicting uh, for many weeks because they were tracking all of this on the kinds of social media sites that you and I would never go on to. Uh, they saw it, they saw it happening. And uh, as Ben said, after the fact, they were, um, they were turning that information over to law enforcement. I will also add that you know, from a local level, our relationships with law enforcement, uh, it, it's key in terms of the work that we do. I've only been on this job for a year and some of the first people I, uh, that I was introduced to was the head of the hate crimes unit in New York, uh, the, uh, the head of the FBI covering New York as well as New Jersey, the Office of Homeland Security for New Jersey. These are critical relationships for ADL. If we're not only gonna fight anti-Semitism and hate, uh, you know, but, but be able to do something about it. We need those relationships with law enforcement. Again, we're a bit of a unique entity within the Jewish community, having those relationships. And those relationships are not just in place over the past few years. We began building those really in the 1950s, recognizing that uh, if we're, we're going to defend ourselves, if we're going to do something about what we're experiencing, we would need those relationships to be strong. This is a moment where law enforcement uh, is a bit um, uh, under pressure, uh, as I know everybody knows, and ADL plays that kind of bridging role where we're, we're a civil rights organization, where we're an entity that works very closely with, uh, with progressive organizations and progressives in this country. But on the other hand, we have such an important relationship with law enforcement. We do an incredible amount of training of law enforcement. Uh, on the order of tens of thousands of law enforcement officials in this country every year uh, in terms of what is anti-Semitism, what is a hate crime, uh, what is extremism. So all of the expertise that ADL uh, has comes to bear, and that's also part of, of building those relationships. Which is why really, Scott, I think ADL is unique, and it was unique, you know, January 6th and way, be, way, way before that, in that it is an integrated approach to understanding that where hate arises and extremism rears its head, anti-Semitism is likely to be a byproduct and could lead to terrorism. It's, it's, that, it's that really very, uh, it's a network approach. Um, uh, and it's not bound you know, by what law enforcement is bound by. So we've seen, you know, you know I didn't know what Antifa was. I, I mean, you know, uh, five years ago, six, seven years ago, I don't think I knew what Antifa was. I, and I still am really not sure. And, and most of the time I hear it, I hear it being quoted in really right-wing rhetoric, but I know that there, there is, and I, and I saw it in the Women's March, there is anti-Semitism on the left as well. Is ADL, how does ADL frame that and help us understand it? Scott, would you like to take this one first? <laughs> sure. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, anti-Semitism uh, on the left often manifests itself uh, as uh, attacks on Israel, uh, attacks on Israel, perhaps even as a substitute for, uh, for Jews. Uh, we certainly saw that play out with the Israel-Hamas conflict in, uh, in May. Uh, now, of course, criticism of Israel 
is not uh, is not anti-Semitism. I think you know I don't have to explain that to this group. Uh, and I, I I didn't hear Rabbi Serkman's sermon today, but I imagine this was a, a piece of it. Uh, when you begin to talk about Israel in such a way that you've singled it out, that you delegitimize it, said it has says it has no right to exist, that's really different. We all. I, I'm sure criticize this country for things that we, we think are wrong, but I don't think we go around saying that the United States has has no right to exist. So, you know, that the, the anti-Semitism of the left is often uh, associated with that. Um, anti-Semitism on the right uh, is often associated with white supremacy, uh, neo-Nazis. I think, um, you know, uh, ADL sees both of those as being very problematic. But I think it's very important for us to understand they're not necessarily dealt with in the same way. Uh, you know, we could say there's anti-Semitism on the right and left, and they're both bad, and, and we, we, we attack both of them, which is true. But we do have to look at them and look at the sources and, and figure out how to attack them in a different way. Uh, anti-Semitism on the right, uh, and ADL uh, maintains a lot of that, that data, uh, has resulted in uh, much, much more violence much more, uh, many more killings in the past few years. Uh, and that's just a manifestation and something that uh, you know, we, we need to be deeply concerned about. I would um, just add one or two things. Um, the, as Scott said, um, anti-Semitism on the left is not, at least so far, been violent, um, even though the right tends to try to sort of proclaim that it is. But one of the other things that um, I think comes to mind, especially as I was listening to your sermon today, Jeffrey, which was excellent, and thank you for that. You know, I love the idea of the bifocal approach, um, you know, and that suggestion is not necessarily something that would have necessarily resonated in Israel with the former leadership, but with the new coalition. Um, just a quick story, uh, Holly and I went on a, on a mission with ADL to meet a very small group of people went and met with the leadership of the new coalition. And it was actually fascinating. And as I've been saying to others who have asked about this, um, I was actually, I came away feeling more hopeful than I ever have been. And, and part of it has to do with just their um, willingness to communicate in a way that Israel never has been able to do before, has never been interested in doing before. So Naftali Bennett, the right winger, Yair Lapid, the centrist, um, the person who was the minister of the diaspora outreach, we met with all of these folks and they essentially said, look, we're going to make the important decisions that are important for Jews and Arabs and Israeli citizens, no matter what. But what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to communicate with the outside world a whole lot better than we have in the past. And we realize that when things go on here and we don't explain, anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic incidences um, flare up, not only in the United States, but also across Europe. Um, during the Gaza incident, for example, um, there, were, there was a 75% spike in anti-Semitic incidences and even more across Europe. And for those who are following Twitter, uh, which the ADL actually monitors closely, there were over 17,000 tweets of the statement, Hitler was right. So this stuff is extraordinarily sensitive. The new government is sensitive to it. Uh, they are politicians, so they like to say things. I just, I think we came away hopeful that they could probably do a better job. And I'm just gonna turn one more thing back to Scott here. One of the jobs that the ADL has is to educate our populace as well as our population, uh, as, our, as well as our politicians. Scott, has has a role to play, especially in our region, in reaching out to our local politicians. Jeffrey mentioned today in his um, speech that uh, a certain uh, congresswoman who has goes by the by letters, um, you know, might have been a person who refers to Israel as an apartheid state. Um, have we made an effort to sort of reach out to folks like this, Scott? Uh, yes. Um... <laughs> This is not a group that uh, is generally interested in, in interacting with us so much, but we, we certainly have, and we've had some interactions. Uh, I know that, you know, for example, Jamal Bowman, uh, it, he aligns himself with that group and happens to be your, your representative. Uh, we did see him the other night 
Uh, so Jamal Bowman came to an event that the Westchester Jewish Council had at the Midwest Chester JCC, uh, and he spoke, and I, I chatted with him. And, uh, you know, there, there is that kind of friendly re relationship, I think, with members of the squad. Uh, AOC seems to be at sort of one end of that, though, uh, and a bit less interested in interacting with mainstream Jewish organizations. Yeah, it's problematic. It really is. Uh, it's uh, it's a slippery slope. Um, listen, I I know that uh, you know ADO has been really helpful to us, and we've been you know we are we are a signature synagogue. Though I think our signature is very small because we don't make use of enough of ADO's resources. But e every year, for the past number, we've had. Um, I feel like it was Hannah Sattler. Was that her name? Yeah. Hannah, who came? You know, and helped us. She was great, um, and, um, and and she met with our, uh, uh, it may have been just 12th graders, but I think it was 11th and 12th and their parents to help them understand how, what are they gonna confront on the college campus? You're gonna walk through and you're gonna see an apartheid state, you know, demo um, with Israel. You may see, you know, uh, you know Israeli, um, officers dressed like Nazis. I mean, you, you just never know. And how do you deal with that? How, so I know that you're helping college entering collegians deal with that because the college campus is the, in a way, the front line. So I'll start on this one. Um, let me just first say that Fred Block, our partner um, at ADL, corrected me. Uh, Stop Hate for Profit actually recruited 1,200 companies not 150 companies, so I am sorry for that mistake. Wow, it was even it was even more successful than I had imagined. Um, but one of the things that Jonathan Greenblatt has done since he started at the organization is he believes in partnerships. He realized that no specific, no one organization does everything absolutely the best. However, the ADL does a lot of things really well, and if we could find organizations that we could partner with who are amazing at doing their thing, and then we help them do their thing, um, we could use some of our resources to actually help them. And so it is along those lines that we've begun to announce a, a series of partnerships, one of which is with Hillel International, uh, which as everybody knows is the largest student organization in the world, Jewish student organization in the world. And ADL will be supplying the expertise to Hillel's reach across campuses. And I think that is just a perfect example of how we're gonna to try to help tackle this, uh, this problem. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll continue with the Hillel party. It was just announced uh, last month, uh, time for start of school. We've always worked with Hillel. These are also some of the first relationships that, uh, that I built when I started this position. Very, very important to, to have those relationships in place, but this is really taking it to the next level. It's creating a mechanism for incident response. So ADL has an incident response form. Anybody can fill it out at adl.org forward slash report incident. But here we're asking college students and Hillel's to work to try to get that information. If you don't know where the problem is or what the problem is, it's very difficult to, uh, to tackle it. Also, we're engaging in a series of training programs with Hillel students and Hillel professionals. Um, uh, also, uh, the program that you mentioned with Hannah Sattler, this has been going on for many years. It's called Words to Action. Words to Action is a training program for high school students, uh, principally, to prepare them for the anti-Semitism they're going to encounter on college campuses. Really important that people, you know, in terms of conceptually how they think about this, that they're not thinking in terms of talking points. First of all, students don't necessarily like all of those talking points because it feels like they're being told what to think and, and what to say. But having some of the big ideas, uh, you know, what is BDS? Uh, why, uh, why do we think uh, BDS is a bad thing? Um, you know, this idea of Israel as somehow being a colonial, colonialist entity, you know, these kinds of things that they may tackle, just sort of a framework for thinking about it and the courage to, to stand up to that. I mean, uh, you know, just a few words on, on BDS. You know, there are many, many, many uh, universities, institutes of higher learning that have 
student organizations that have brought BDS resolutions uh, to the university and quite a number of them passed those student councils, but almost none of them actually made it to the administration, meaning uh, almost none of them were actually passed by the administration. So in a practical sense, these resolutions have no impact in terms of universities divesting their funds from uh, entities related to Israel. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's not uh, the, the goal of organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace or Students for Justice in Palestine, which are the two major organizations working on campuses. Their goal is to impact the hearts and minds of the next generation. So, you know, the resolution may not pass, but they've done their work. If a lot of people on campus who have no connection to Israel suddenly are confronted with words like apartheid and colonialism and genocide, and these are the words they begin to associate with Israel, and maybe they're college students now, but, uh, you know, 15, 20 years from now, they're going to be in important positions. And you very rarely see these resolutions being brought at small universities that perhaps are not so well known. You often see them at the top universities. Again, it, it feels like a, a calculated effort to change the, the hearts and minds of those who are going to be the leaders in the next generation. And, you know, our, our kids, uh, I have a daughter in university, uh, they're the front lines. They're the ones who need to tell people that this is not the case, that, you know, the, the information that you're hearing is not necessarily true and investigate yourself. Yeah, I mean, in the ADL, I mean, we, and we've experienced it here, uh, you know, anti-Semitic incidents, nothing major, but things that happened that were so disturbing, um, you know, we brought in for our sixth, seventh graders, um, it may have been, it wasn't Words to Action, it was another program for the sixth, seventh grade. Uh, I forget There's what it was. There's also Words to Action for younger kids. Yeah, so. and then we did Words to Action for high schoolers. Um, I wanted to bring in No Place for Hate in the school system, which is a program ADL does in the public school, which I thought would be perfect for homics because that's where a couple of incidents happened. And it, it, for, some, for whatever reason, the homics administrators had too much in their plate and couldn't get it done. So this is what I'm saying to you. And it, Ben doesn't have to say it, Scott doesn't have to say it. We should have a few ADL. Now we have one regional liaison who's Linda Reefberg, but we should have a sort of a, and thank you, Linda. We should have a, a small group, three people, four people, who are sort of our ADL liaisons in, to our community to help integrate the work of ADL into the greater community and into the temple community. Meaning, if there's an organization, if the Lofty kids, if we think it's going to work with, you know, with our Lador Vador program or family life programming, or if we think really that the high school should have an ADL sponsored program to advocate for that and to be, because ADL is ready to do whatever they can do to help combat hate and stand up against anti-Semitism in particular. You guys are great. You're wonderful to be here. Um, I'm sure that we could keep it going, but it's 2.42 and the next one starts at 2.45. Um, Marty Cannon Geyser has been very nice sending me little chat notes, but do you have any last word? Uh, my last word is just to pick up on what you said. Linda Reefberg is amazing. You're very lucky to have her as a member of your community. She, we have an entity called ADL Westchester, focused specifically on ADL's work in Westchester, and she is the co-chair. And if you're interested in getting involved, you should reach out to Linda and she'll hook you up. We have a really great group of people uh, who are doing this around the county um, and you're, you're fortunate that she's in your community. And I would just say, hear, hear. <laughs> and and don't, you know, don't miss what I was saying. I'm not that subtle. Linda is a regional co-chair. I want local people on the ground Synagogue to synagogue, community to community, liaisoning on ADL's work and how do we foster combating hate, standing up against that indifference and indignity on the local level. So I think that, you know, I'll talk to Linda about it because she doesn't have enough to do, um, but uh, as an, a, a super volunteer and a leader, but, um, but I think that we have work to do together. So um, you gentlemen are wonderful. We could not appreciate you more. I'm sure the 30 people that are on 
uh, agree with me. Um, and we feel fortunate that Ben Sachs is the incoming chair of ADL. So we'll talk more. Absolutely. Look forward to it. All right. Easy Thanks, rest of your best and uh, sweet, healthy new year. Thanks. You too.